Spencer Proffer is a media producer and cinematic storyteller. He has served as a supervising music producer on over 129 films and television programs and produced and executive produced 32 film and broadcast events to date. Now, many of those productions have garnered Academy, Golden Globe, Emmy, Grammy, and even Tony Awards and nominations. And as a music producer, Spencer Proffer has sold millions of gold and platinum records. Today, we are here to discuss his newest music documentary, Reinventing Elvis, The 68 Comeback, the new feature-length documentary about the making of the television special that revitalized Elvis Presley's career and influenced music, television, and pop culture for decades to come. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome media producer extraordinaire Spencer Proffer to the show. Welcome. How are you doing? You did your homework. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. And uh, by the way, I loved the documentary. And uh, my first question to you is, what interests you the most to take on the challenge to tell the story about Elvis's iconic 68 comeback TV special? A friendship for 55 years with Steve Bender, who was a badass who actually challenged Parker, showed him that he was a criminal and uh, he was possibly wanted for murder in a Holland. And to, to really tell Steve's story, at 90 years old, he deserves the halo. I love him, he's like an older brother to me. So the challenge was not great. The challenge was putting a halo on someone who deserved it. Yeah, and Steve Bender did one of the most incredible jobs on creating the 68 Comeback Special. And I, I love the fact that in the documentary, he basically kicks it off and says that Anything that could go wrong did go wrong, but some way, somehow they pulled this off and it's now become one of the most iconic television specials uh, that have ever graced the airways of television. I agree with you. And I think he was blessed because he's a good guy. There was no such thing as unplugged. There was no such thing as handheld cameras in the round. And he was a pioneer way back to the Tammy show, which was the first rock movie, which Steve directed, which was got 18, 14 years before the Elvis comeback special. So Steve was like no amateur. And I'm thrilled that he not only pulled it off and Elvis loved him, and the public loved him, but it's time to tell his story through his lens. That's what we did. And Paramount Plus, God bless them, Bruce Gilmer and their staff really believed in the vision, so they stood next to me. Well, you know, as I was watching the documentary, what I really love the way that you put this together is you really brought back, you brought in a very deep backstory, not just about the 68 comeback special, but on Steve himself, for us, the, the viewer and us, the fans of Elvis, to really learn what really went on to bring this to the past. I mean, how much of a rebel was Steve Bender? Big time. I'm, I want to shout out John Scheinfeld, the director, because I did brainstorm five years ago with John. When Steve and I put his book together about his experience and making it through his lens, this is really one of the first feature length docs. I hate the word documentary. It's a mini film in the form of a documentary because it's faxed, but um, we wanted to bring the book to life. God bless John. He subscribed. He got it. And we really wanted to look at the social cultural landscape of the period, not just Steve's journey. Steve's journey was tremendous, but when you combine Steve's journey with the challenges of the day the, during Vietnam, during all the BS that happened, and Parker only wanted to cash in chips to make money, calling it a Christmas special, I think that's the story worth telling. It is worth telling. And, you know, Steve, and you're right, Steve Bender was definitely a rebel. And I love the story uh, within this film that uh, you brought to light about Petula Clark and Harry Belafonte not realizing that that, that uh, pairing on television uh, raised a lot of eyebrows. Well, what really happened, and this is something that Steve and I talked about five years ago, and then John beautifully brought that to life, was that it was a natural organic thing when uh, Petula Clark put her hand on Harry Belafonte as he was singing. And the fact he was black, he was white, he was purple. It was a human thing to do. When the sponsors went ape and they said, no, you can't do this, Steve being the great guy that he is, went down the hall, as you saw, with Petula, with Petula's husband. And he had his editor erase all the other takes. 
Why? Because Steve thought it was important to see a black man and a white woman touch. Yeah, it sparked controversy. It changed the game a little bit. But Steve was the first guy to put, you know, African American artists in music television. Even before that, with the NAACP special with Marvin Gaye and James Brown and the Supremes and the Tammy Show. So for Steve, this was just a next step journey. And that's what got the attention of Bob Finkel, who hired him to do the Elvis thing and to actually go eye to eye with Parker. You know, I love the fact that in this film that we were able to see Elvis um, with a little bit of insecurity uh, to <laughs> really dive deep into the man behind this this legendary iconic status that Elvis has become decade after decade, and it just continues to grow. But to see the a little bit of the fear, the insecurity, uh, stepping out into the unknown to do this 68 comeback special with Steve, um, I think I think it's going to create even more Elvis fans uh, more than ever because now we get to see the human side of Elvis. Well, you know, what's really interesting is that all superstars, be it brilliant Barbara Streisand or Peter Gabriel or Paul McCartney, every superstar has that little bit of trepidation and insecurity in them. Elvis being the top of the heap, he having not performed live for 10 years because Parker wanted to commission his movies, the bad ones, but he didn't care. And Elvis only sang bad songs that were written for bad movies. And Steve kind of saw that, which is why we contrasted, you know, Cool Hand Luke and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and films, Bonnie and Clyde, films that really made a difference in pop culture. But Steve saw that Elvis is a really good guy. He was a real sensitive human being that wanted to go out and show everybody what he was. And the minute that he got, he hung with his guys in the round and he performed, you saw the pure Elvis, that's the real deal. And the fact that one is insecure, we're all insecure. You're insecure before you did this podcast, so am I. I didn't even take the kind of deep shower I should have taken, but I was insecure I wouldn't look as good because we're on live TV, but really, it's gonna be what it is. Elvis was what it was. He's brilliant, Steve was brilliant, and I'm very pleased that John and I were able to bring the halo to Steve. Well, I love the fact that uh, Elvis trusted uh, Steve Bender with a with a lot of the creative ideas, even though yep. Elvis, you know, he was still wondering if it was going to work or what people would think of him. Um, and I don't want to give everything away because I want all of the viewers and listeners out there to watch this film because it's coming to Paramount Plus August 15th. It's got to be at the top of your must see list because it is that Good. This is the first time we've ever seen the complete story of the behind the scenes of the 68 comeback. Now, one of the things that I guess not really shocked me, but the way that you brought it forth really confirmed a lot of things. But for you, was it a shock to you to learn how big a villain Colonel Tom Parker really was in Elvis's career? Not not whatsoever, Stephen. I actually had an option on a brilliant book written by Alana Nash, who was interviewed in our doc on Colonel Parker, how she had traveled to Holland. We knew that he was a scumbag. He wasn't really a colonel. He was a circus barker who exploited Elvis. I have no love lost for him. And um, so it was no surprise. It was actually part of mine and Steve's urging to tell the truth. And one thing you can never get you know, nailed in a libel suit. Truth is the best defense. Notwithstanding anything that anybody could say, the truth is the truth. And Colonel Parker did what he did. And Steve did what he did. Called the truth. You know, as uh, as I was watching the film, and I, I know that a lot of Elvis fans uh, think the same way, uh, they believe that after the 68 comeback special, there was a little glimmer of hope that the possibility that... Uh, Steve Bender would end up managing Elvis. Was there any truth to that? The truth was friendship. The truth was, as you saw in the film, Elvis gave Steve very quietly after he watched it in a room by himself, a phone number. When Steve dialed the number to talk to Elvis, you know that Parker and his henchmen got hold of that. 
they got they made the number a non-working number and when steve wanted to go to vegas to see elvis he was blacklisted parker would not let him go backstage so the point is like alana said in the doc had steve have continued had he, had parker not played on elvis's insecurity given the father figure that he needed and parker played that role yeah i think elvis might not have died as overweight and as screwed up as he was but steve went on to do great work with diana ross and other people because he is that guy Elvis lost at the end of the day, and I think the fans lost, but what we have is the comeback special, and we have the magic of Elvis's career in the 50s when he paid tribute to the Lieber Solar songs, and he actually very influenced by gospel music, and I'm a big fan of that side of Elvis all the way up through the special. Vegas posts that, you know what? Have a party, you know? I don't care. <laughs> no, I, I agree on the gospel side of Elvis, and I've always wondered... Uh, because the the special ends when Elvis sings uh, "If I Can Dream," Lo I absolutely love that song. It's a very powerful song. But I was amazed that Elvis never sang that song after the '68 comeback special. Do you know why? Yep, Earl Brown, who wrote it, worked for Steve. And as they sat backstage and watched in real time the Bobby Kennedy assassination and the fact that it was in Memphis and Martin Luther King was killed there. And Steve really felt, and Elvis felt, he wanted to tribute people having a dream. If you remember Martin Luther King's, you know, iconic line, you know, we all have a dream. And that's what that song was. So I think Elvis felt spiritually, it was a moment in time. He sang it in lieu of the uh, Christmas song that Colonel Parker wanted. Parker very surreptitiously grabbed the publishing to that. One thing I can only tell you is there was one other song that Earl Brown wrote for Elvis that he would not let Parker have the publishing. Steve and I control it, it exists. We might share it with the world 50 years later, but not in phase one. I think what we want to do, and this is Steve and I, Steve's very dear to me. His family is, my, my wife and his wife are friends. It's real inside baseball. And I think for all the Elvis fans and millions of fans around the world, there's a lot of stuff they don't know. There's a reason there's a guitar in the uh, Paramount One Sheet versus Elvis, because this isn't about Elvis. This is about Elvis coming back. And the real comeback is through Steve's lens, through the guitar, through the music. You know, after all of these years um, since Elvis had passed, are you amazed that the fans literally cannot get enough of Elvis Presley. It's like, it's almost like everybody seems to know every story there is to know, but they still want more. Is there more? I think this was the more that they've been craving. And I've talked to a couple of the leaders of the fan clubs who are big, big, timeless fans of Steve Bender. And it's about time. I think the real thing is we got the real thing. Elvis was a real deal. And why people, my son Sterling is 36, my other son Morgan is 34, they're fans, because he's a real artist. He's a real rock and roller, he's a real performer. And I think what we see in this special, is in this particular film, is the very essence of what Elvis was. He was human, he was insecure, he was cool, he was funny, he's just like, the real deal. And I wish there were more artists of today that were as real as he is. I think we could look over, you know, you could look at the stock and Elvis is as cool as anybody that's happening today. I, I completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, when the, the Elvis movie came out last year, I mean, everything Elvis just exploded and even created a brand new fan base after all of these years. And now the younger generation wants to know more and more about Elvis. And of course, there's so much out there to learn. But like I said, they continually just wanting to feed uh, on more and more of who Elvis was. And uh, but Steve, I mean, Spencer, you did the most extraordinary job on this film it, out of from the 68 comeback special. Uh, what is, what would you deem as your most favorite uh, part of the whole special? Elvis singing Jailhouse Rock. No, my favorite part was Elvis's humanity. 
the tenderness, the multi-levels of Elvis, when you see him in the Bordello scene, when you see him as the guitar man, you actually see the various shades of Elvis's personality. But I think that, you, you know, you said something that was spot on. When Steve and I had lunch with Baz Luhrmann, as Baz was explaining to us that what he was going to do and how he wanted to do a segment of his Soup to Nuts Elvis story in the Elvis movie with uh, Austin Butler, who was terrific. We wanted to telescope a moment that was very transitional. And we made the deal, I made the deal for Steve to consult Baz at Warner Brothers, and we timed it so that the public would have a resurgence of Elvis and then right behind it to feed that insatiable appetite of who and what he really was on top of all the magic that Baz brought out. I think Baz did a brilliant job. I think Steve did a brilliant job as well. And I want to give John Scheinfeld again the shout out. He directed it. I kind of quarterback the game, but when you hand the ball to your Heisman halfback and he scores the TD, that's what I think we did. And you did a stellar job, Spencer. And, you know, you bring up the Elvis movie, uh, you know, directed by Baz Luhrmann. And my favorite part of that whole film was just the story on the 68 comeback special. And I had the opportunity to sit down uh, with uh, Jerry Schilling. And we talked about that 68 comeback uh, portion of the film and how important it was not only for Elvis's career, uh, but even the backstory of, you know, uh, if I could dream how that came came about, knowing that 1968 was I don't even know how you would describe that year in American history. And uh, but it seems that Elvis singing that song, it was it was a divine moment in time for and it had to be Elvis to do that. And I think in a way brought the country together and in a way kind of brought brought hope back after a year that a lot of people would soon want to forget. I think you hit it right on the head. I think that was Steve's instinct. It was something he and Elvis talked about. He didn't have the conversation with Parker because Parker could care less. You know, he could be singing yummy, yummy, but got love in my tummy if it got ratings. As far as, you know, Parker was concerned, but Elvis was deeply concerned about what was happening in our country. Steve was deeply concerned about it. And I agree with you. And it's, it was nice too, because Jerry Schilling actually called Steve the other night to congratulate him, to tell him it was finally about time he got the halo, which is great. Jerry's a great guy, he was there. And, um, but the moment in that Baz fictionally had Elvis ask Steve under the Hollywood sign, what do you think of my career? And Steve says, it's in the toilet. Well, that really happened a little more one-to-one -one behind four walls, but the essence of it, and Baz dramatized it because it was beautifully done there. The essence of it was, that was the moment. The career was in the toilet and Steve took it out of the toilet. He flushed it and he made it clean. And um, my hat's off to him. I had the vision, I've had it all along, but I give Steve the props because he had the vision 55 years ago. John helped me take my vision, he executed it. And I think, I hope this is a film for all time. For those who love Elvis, it's gotta be in their collection. When we put our DVD with our bonus features out, which will be done six months from now. And Paramount is the best partner a human being could have as a creator because they get music. They remember MTV, VH1, CMT is all under their umbrella. So I think we waited a moment, Steve and I did. We've wanted to do this for Gosh, six years, Steve and I had lunch, had some sushi and talked about what it could be. He wrote the book and we brought it to life. And you did just that. And it, I, I look back because uh, it's kind of funny, Spencer, because of the fact that when I talked to Jerry uh, and I brought it up to Jerry that, you know, I would love to see more in-depth story on the 68 comeback. And it he was... I, Part of me thinks that he was being a little coy about it. And he said, well, <laughs> you know, you may see something in the future about that, not knowing that uh, your film has come at the perfect time. Um, Elvis Week is about to 
debut again for 2023. And here we have, ladies and gentlemen, Reinventing Elvis, the 68 comeback. It is available on Paramount Plus beginning August 15th. So make a note because you don't want to miss this. I've seen it. It is one of the best films about the 68 comeback and on Elvis because you're going to see the man and in a way that you've never seen him before. So if you are an Elvis fan, this film will take you deeper into his comeback. And if you're not a fan yet, you will be once you see the most complete film documentary to tell the incredible backstory that cemented Elvis's legacy as the king of rock and roll. Uh, Spencer, any last words you'd like to share with us about the uh, film? I've done a few podcasts. I've done a few interviews. I think you did your homework better than anybody I've spoken to. I'm thrilled that Steve will be talking to a lot of people. I agree with everything you said. And I just hope that the public and the world feels the same way. Because again, what we're living in is an era that we need the truth after what we've been through for the last 10 years in our society. And I think if there's anything about this film that I love more than Steve himself, it's that he told the truth and it's embodied in John Scheinfeld was able as a brilliant director to bring it forward to the world. And again, ladies and gentlemen, Spencer just said it. This film gives you, I mean, unwavering truth through the eyes and the voice of Steve Bender, literally bringing Elvis Presley back and uh, and we have we have a lot to thank Steve for and Spencer and all of those that have worked on this film again to bring us the best in filmmaking and to bring us the truth about the king of rock and roll Elvis Presley and Spencer I want to thank you so much for spending time with us today. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's much better than I thought it would be. And I'm going to remember this. Make sure to send me a link so I can share it with my wife and my family. Because truth is something that I want to preach to my, for my legacy. I have a new grandson who's four months old. And I can't wait to play this to him when he's cognitive. And he'll learn about the truth. Because I think that's what we can do for the next generation. Always tell the truth. Uh, amen to that. And again, ladies and gentlemen, Reinventing Elvis, the 68 Comeback will be available on Paramount Plus beginning August 15th. Again, you, it's a don't miss. It's a must-see. And uh, <laughs> get your family rally around your television and uh, watch it because you will be amazed. And once it's over, you're still going to be talking about it because of the fact that it's that good. And it just makes you want more and more of Elvis. And again, Spencer, thank you so much for honoring us with your time. And ladies and gentlemen, hey... I'll be right back with more.